is about uh, one about math heuristics. So this combination of uh, generally a, a heuristic search, a local search, some heuristic search, and the combination with uh, mixed programming. So, but we don't do this uh, heuristic in a way that is just um, some greedy heuristic. Uh, we try to make it smart in a way that we guide this heuristic with uh, those dual physical functions, which are developed for bin packing problems. And that's why we call this uh, feasibility constraints guided uh, math heuristic. So this is a joint work uh, with my co-author, Riemann Palach from uh, King's College, London. Okay, so I will start with the introduction of dual feasible functions uh, for bin packing problems. Uh, this would be the first part of uh, the topic, and I will explain how to um, generally use the mass reduction scheme for uh, bin packing instances, so how we can make them smaller, and uh, also how we can uh, leave the lower bounds. So I will consider uh, one dimensional bin packing two-dimensional bin packing, but all these things, they are applicable for generally for d-dimensional bin packing problems. So then I will switch to our illustrative example, which is an unweight uh, oriented guillotine variable size two-dimensional bin packing problem. So many words there. Well, the problem is not that hard to understand. And I will show you how we can incorporate those things into our heuristic search. And bring them as part of mixing and programming uh, models, and we can strengthen the models and we can strengthen the look ahead mechanism. And then I will uh, do some computational experiments with you, I show the results, and uh, I will uh, finalize with conclusion and future work. So uh, people interested in this uh, talk might wish to read our paper, which is a recent publication uh, in the journal. Okay, so uh, if I will start with a one dimensional bin packing problem, so many people know this from just uh, university classes. Uh, the problem is that we are given a set of uh, n items, and every item has uh, its size. So we have size uh, AI in uh, this definition, and we have some budget or capacity or size over. Bin, right? So it's very similar in some sense to this classical knapsack problem. But now the question is that we have many sort of knapsacks and we try to minimize the number of used knapsacks. So we try to place the items and distribute them among the bins in the efficient way and minimize the utilization of the bins. So we try to minimize and get the minimum number of bins. So when this is a classical problem, um, and many um, aspects of our are related to this problem as a case study. Well, for example, column generation, many other things. So this is a good example. But uh, well, for sure, even if the problem is quite simple, well, computationally, right? It's still an be hard problem. Uh, we try to make it even simpler, right? So, and the questions that we pose are how we can reduce the size of uh, the problem instances, right? we are given. So how can we improve the value of the lower bound? So how we can leave this, how we can better evaluate the least number of bins that uh, we need to pack the given items. So what is the dual bound? And uh, can we modify the size of the items? So without changing the value of the optimal, because one way to reduce the size of the problems and to leave the lower bound is to modify the items. So we will play with the sizes of the items and see how we can do these modifications so that we don't, uh, well, cut off the optimal. Well, uh, the well-known continuous lower bound, and we will start from here because generally we'll be using this lower bound but we will strengthen this, this bound. So the continuous lower bound uh, is easy to find. So this is just the sum of all sizes across the set of instances, or sorry, a set of item, items, and we just divide it by the capacity of our bin. So this is the sum of CIs divided by C and rounded up. So if you will calculate this, it will be really weak, right? So the worst case uh, uh, for, for this lower bound is one over two. So it's very easy to check. So if you will check 
to items which have sizes slightly larger than the half of the bin, right? So, and then the answer would be potentially that, for example, in two-dimensional, right, case, so that these two items can be packed together, but in reality, you will need uh, not one bin, but two bins. So the worst case, one is one over two. And this is weak bound, and we'll try to uh, improve this bound. So, and the main question uh, around application of dual physical functions is, uh, can we get a better bound by excluding small items? So just ignoring them, right? And uh, by increasing the size of the large items. So we will try to uh, enforce the impact of large items in our problem instances. And for small instances, we just exclude them from consideration. So that's why it's related to both log bound and also to reduction scheme. Okay, so to improve the continuous bound, we want to multiply the size of the items so that the obtained instance is feasible if the original one is feasible. And in this sense, we can apply what is known as a dual physical function introduced by Johnson in 1973. Uh, and there are two definitions. So different authors, they use different sort of notation, but they both are convertible. So the first definition is that function, and uh, we have this application from zero, one range to zero, one range. So uh, this function is the feasible function um, for a finite set um, generally C or S in this case, I think so, right? So of real numbers, if it holds that the sum of X in our left-hand side here, right? The sum of sizes in our case is less than one. So if we will apply geofix, so we will transform the size of the items and we'll get new sizes, maybe larger sizes. So then it still will be smaller than one. So this must hold. So some other authors, they consider so-called discrete dual physical functions. So uh, for example, uh, Carlier, uh, they consider this one and Paquette and Sheffers, they consider the first definition with uh, real numbers. For discrete dual physical function, well, that is exactly the same. So we have this application from zero, X, where X is generally our capacity, uh, to uh, zero and X prime, so that if it was feasible in uh, the first original instance, then application of this function will not change the feasibility and it will not cut off the optimal. So we will get this function and this value f of X, right? So what is uh, important to see that, uh, uh, well, first of all, this is a constraint immediately, and we will be using this constraint. So generally, uh, if we will calculate the sum of um, modified sizes, then divided by x prime, this will give you our new number of bins, right? That we will need at least to pack um, the given set of items. So we will be using it in a different way so that uh, we will check if a given set of items can be packed in one single bin, right? So that's why our right hand side would be just in this case one, right? Or it will be a, a size, the modified size of the bin. Uh, but we will be applying these functions not in the way of calculating the physical. Uh, sorry, uh, calculating lower bound, we will be using this lower bound as a uh, true or false answer when we try to pack items into a single bin. Okay, so we will uh, be solving a uh, decision problem. So both uh, teams of authors, so Fiquette and Shepherds, they were the first, and then uh, Carlier, Cloutier, uh, they proposed very similar approach they both are using three sets of functions. So I will try just to give you a rough idea how it works and some observations behind and uh, well, all this black magic. So the first function is the classical one. This is a simple one. It's called F or K, right? So K is generally our parameter and K is, uh, well, it's greater than one and smaller than half of the beam, right? Size. 
So the observation is that if no items can be packed with an item AI of size CI, uh, so the size of AI can be increased to one, right? So uh, if we don't have anything to pack with the large items generally, so then the size of large items can be immediately lifted and become one, right? Uh, or the size of the bin. Well, one and the size of the bin, it's, it's the same thing. It's just about uh, scaling this or normalizing to uh, the size of the bin. So that's why we can increase it to the size of the bin. Um, well, this is an iterative approach and we need to consider all Ks. But if, for example, we will fix K, and then we will calculate this function based on a given AI and it's CI as uh, the size. So this is our X. So you may see that um, if this X is smaller than this parameter K, then we just ignore it. So its new size would be zero and it will be eliminated from consideration. So if X is between K and C minus K, which is capacity minus this parameter K. So it will remain as X. And then, so if it's greater than this C minus K, it will be like the full capacity of the bin, the full size, and it will be C. So the idea is that the size of the items of size strictly than a C minus K can be increased as can be seen from the observation if all smaller then k items of smaller size, um, they are removed. So this third case just removes small items and the first case um, lifts their sizes to the full capacity. And if it's somewhere in between, it's just transfer transformed to x as it was before. So the size doesn't change. So, and well, we what we do with the new sizes, we just apply the continuous lower bound as we have seen already from the previous slide and we calculate new continuous bound but now it's based on lifted or modified uh, modified sizes of the items. So there is another function which is f1 of k and this function introduced by Carlier control this is instance dependent function. So again we are playing with the large items and small items and it's instant dependent function because um, we apply this and we have to consider not just our given X, the size of a particular item, but we also have to consider all other sizes that we are given in our particular instance. So what we have, we construct this set J and generally J is a subset of items so that the sizes are greater than this parameter k, but still smaller than the half of the bin size, right? the bin's capacity. And for this j and for given capacity x, we calculate, well, what we know as a knapsack solution, but this is cardinality-based knapsack. So we determine the maximum number of items um, with a size of ci such that uh, they can be packed together in uh, one single container of size X, right? And generally X is, uh, X, X is parameterized, right? Uh, in our function. So, um, unless, like I said, this function is data dependent because it depends on uh, the whole set of items and also depends on the value C. But the idea behind is that we are uh, try to transform the given size into some, let's say, so uh, um, units, right, of cardinality. So if we have, for example, full capacity, we apply this function and then we get the number of items that we, with the maximum number of items that we can pack into this container. So now we, what we do, we again, we ignore all small items so if we have x and x is between this parameter k and it's less than half of the beam, it will be transformed into one item, right? So in, into one um, unit of space, let's say so. And then for 
the case where x exceeds one over two capacity, um, then what we do, we know how many items at most we can pack into one single bin, and we subtract from this number how much, well, how many units will be required to pack uh, c minus x, right, to pack uh, uh, this given item of size x. And uh, so we consider how much space is left and using this space, how many items of set J we can pack there. And then we do this calculation. So technically what we calculate, we see how many units this um, size X takes with regard to this cardinality problem. So, and then we transform area, or we transform sizes into cardinality space and again we operate with the units and now we uh, will generally know how many units we need uh, at least to pack uh, the items that are given as the problem instance. Well this is a bit more complicated uh, data dependent feasible dual feasible function but the good thing is that it still can be solved in polynomial in general generally in linear time if we have uh, items sorted by the increasing order of the size, right? So this can be calculated just by iterating through the, through the array of items. And we have one more uh, function, which is, well, this is a mistake. It's not instance dependent function, but it's dual feasible function. So it's based on a specific rounding technique. So those who are really interested in proof, they may consider the paper. So there is a proof for this uh, function that is the physical function and that the optimum is preserved. Um, so I will omit it in this presentation, but there is one more function. So generally we have three different functions and now the question is how to apply them to get um, an improved up uh, log bound. So again, all functions, they have polynomial time complexity, so they are very fast and um, well, there is a framework. So if we fix a function, so zero, one, or two, the first, second, or the third function. So what we do, as I mentioned, we just calculate the sum of modified sizes, and then we divide it by more modified size of the bin, right? So we, again, here, we are using this continuous lower bound, but now this continuous lower bound is applied on top of modified sizes. And then if we will iterate through different values of K, we get, well, generally the maximum value. And then we just get the maximum value um, across application of all three different functions. So that's the formula is. Well, now the question is how we can extend these results so that we uh, can solve um, multidimensional bin packing problems. And we are lucky because for, for example, for two-dimensional oriented bin packing problem. So oriented means that we cannot rotate the items when we do packing, but now items, they are two-dimensional. So they have uh, widths and heights, right? So, and we also have a rectangular uh, bin, so of size W H. So, but the question is still the same. We need to find the minimum number of bins required to pack uh, the given set of items. So the framework proposed by Fekat and Shepherds says that um, we can still apply these functions uh, for every separate dimension of, uh, of the problem. So in the first dimension and the second dimension, high and width. And then we can explore all combinations of uh, the modified sizes so that we get the lifted bound. So what we can do, we can fix our two our functions. Now we work with the two functions. So for example, zero and for example, one. So uh, we will apply function one or zero to uh, our widths. And uh, function two, we for example, can apply for heights. And we do the same with uh, our dimensions for the bin. And then we, uh, well, so the, 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 this term um, 
in numerator, it will provide us a modified area in this case, not just a modified size. It will be based on modified width and modified height. So it will provide us with a um, modified area and we will divide this by modified area of the beam. So, and then we will explore all generally nine combinations of double physical functions. They will be parameterized by K and L which still are our parameters, then we'll take the maximum, we'll get the lifted bound for two-dimensional beam packing problem. So, um, for example, Fiket and Shepherds, if I remember it correctly, they uh, showed that this bound has the walls case now, which is 3 over 4. So we have 25% better bound generally comparing it to our uh, continuous lower bound for two-dimensional case in this case. Okay, so, well, these formulas will give us uh, the lower bound, right? But we, and many times, these dual physical functions, they applied straightforward. So what they do, they uh, take an instance, calculate the lower bound, because this lower bound would be uh, as a stop criteria, uh, stop criterion, for example, for, uh, I don't know, branch and bound, or maybe heuristic search to um, uh, prove the optimality. So, but we now try to introduce them immediately into the uh, solution approach, right? So that's why we are not really interested in uh, getting the minimum number of bins, estimated number of bins to pack the given items, but we are rather interested in solving a decision problem. So if I give you a bin and a set of items, then the question is if you can pack these items into this bin, yes or no, right? So this yes or no, we can incorporate into decision making uh, made by our approach, right? So, well, if it's less than zero, or sorry, less than one, or the less than, uh, less than uh, the size of the Bin, right, depending on if we are using continuous dual physical functions or discrete dual physical functions. So if it's less, then we still are unsure. So it can be that it's still uh, the feasible packing is possible, or it's simply that we have a um, gap between the lower bound uh, estimation and the optimum. Well, the answer is true in this case. But if it exceeds one, or the size or modified size of the beam, this X prime, then the answer is immediately no, right? So we will use this as a feasibility constraint. Okay, so, and that's why here I start with uh, our illustrative example. So how to incorporate those bounds and these mechanisms into a solution approach. So we are given this unweighted, oriented, gelatin variable size, two-dimensional beam packing problem. So it appears as a hot topic nowadays for cutting and packing community. I don't know how many uh, members we have in Australia. I haven't seen many in a, that special uh, OR group um, called EasyCup. So I hope that this is something interesting. But if you will consider this as an aspect of furniture production, then the problem is important, it's uh, of vital importance, because normally we have small potential parts and they have to be produced from a collection of heterogeneous potential sheets, right, of plywood, for example. And we need to do this with a beam saw, so we need to uh, maintain the sequence of gelatin edge to edge cuts. So that's why this problem is gelatin, and we have variable sized uh, two-dimensional beam packing because we have uh, different different bits generally. Okay, so here's the problem. And uh, in this case, we don't want to minimize the number of bins, but we rather would like to minimize the total cost of used bins, or we try to minimize uh, the waste of the bins that we use. So in our case, cost uh, is calculated as a product of the length and width of uh, a given bin type. So we are working now with the bin types until we have M potential bin types. And we assume that we uh, have infinite supply. So every 
uh, bin, like bin one, can be uh, provided in infinite quantity. So the same about bin two, j, and generally bin m, right? So we have many copies of those bins, and we have a set of items. So uh, and now we try to find solution which has the minimal cost. So why this um, problem is interesting? Like I said, it's really practical problem. And uh, many scheduling, cutting, maintenance problems, uh, they can be uh, uh, reduced or can contain this problem as a subproblem. So for example, the recent road dev Euro change was on glass cutting problem, where we had a sheet of very expensive glass. And there are some defects that generally would like to, well, exclude, right, from, well, we can't use them as part of some I don't know, products, but uh, we would like to show cut in a way that we avoid those defects in our parts, in our items, but we try to maximize the used surface of the glass sheet, right? So in this case, uh, we may see if we will make some glitting cuts, again, we will uh, make sort of design pattern in a way that we will have many potential bins and the, now those bins can be used as a bins to pack our items. So we can convert the original problem into a very precise bin packing problem in this case. Okay, so um, yeah, so the problem is really challenging. So generally, a uh, general measure bin packing problem is challenging, but now it's even more complicated uh, because we have many different bins, right? So, um, and the problem is that we have many asymmetric solutions because generally we can place uh, items in different bins and uh, those solutions may result into solutions of equal cost. Okay, so what we try to do, and uh, we try to build an alternative to traditional bin packing heuristics. So what are those heuristics? So those heuristics mainly um, are best fit, first fit, all different sort of fit approaches, right? So best fit, it means that we will take, we have a collection of items, we will take the best, um, well, we will take a bin and we'll select an item that fits this current being into well, we can which we consider in the best way, right? So maximizing, for example, packing coefficient or utilization utilization coefficient. So heuristics are really greedy, right? And we they don't perform that well as we would like. So there are many, many, many different uh, meta heuristics: genetic algorithms, evolution algorithms, double search, uh, whatever. So what they also do, they generally consider bins one after another and try to pack them in an efficient way. Then they try to permutate the order and do the same, let's say, best fit packing again. So many times it's just best fit wrapped into some uh, meta heuristic framework, right? So, well, we don't like this <laughs> and we would like to build a better approach so that doesn't make just sort of brute force, just permutation, but has some look ahead. So it has some observation of what it does, right? So that's why we try to achieve this futuristic vision. So we want to reserve a free space for all unpacked items, not just consider the current bin and the item that are currently in, uh, in, in, I mean, in our scope or vision, but we try to consider all items at once and generate all available positions at once. And we would like to do this in a way that we reserve space for all unpacked items. So we try to pack as far as we uh, see that the remaining items can be packed into given bins. And those bins, they don't exceed the value of the provided or the known incumbent solution. So again, reserve a free space for all unpacked items while exploring, exploring all available free regions and different cards. Uh, so that's why we try to focus on only potential uh, physical packing alternatives. So make the packing procedure less greedy. So because we consider not just a single bin, but we try more sophisticated solution, uh, well, considering all 
all, all bins, all positions at once. And uh, we try to decrease the number of iterations because now we put more items at the same time, we try to decrease the number of iterations that we will need to do to pack all the items. So this is one aspect. Another aspect, we try to guide our approach uh, with a look ahead. So we want to use mixture programming, which we augment with a already explained dual feasible constraints with dual feasible functions, which will prohibit partial, currently feasible solutions, but solutions which will for sure will become infinite in the, our later stages, right? So uh, we can use dual feasible functions to immediately say if the remaining part of solution is, well, unpacked items, if packing is still feasible, or it already invisible and we can terminate the search immediately. So that's why we direct the search towards a feasible packing. We um, enable current decisions to take um, into account the impact on future cycles. And we try to prune invisible parts of the search space uh, before we uh, descend in the search let's say search tree and we explore them and we try to enforce so this works well with uh, uh in, well with given bonds with some um, incumbent solutions that may already exist uh we try to enforce those bonds so yeah so this is what i said so before i will go with all the diagrams and explain how it works so i would like to start with a numeric example because it will illustrate i think uh, what we do in the best way, our, or our, all our ideas. So in this case, what we have, we have uh, two types of bins. We have T1 and T2, and we have different costs. So we have 28, so we have a smaller bin, and we have a larger one. And we have quite many uh, items, so we have 15 items. So we are given, well, as in the common solution, we are given this upper bound. It's already known that we need to get new bound which is less than 700 we'll try to do this and because we start our cost of the partial solution is zero so what we do we solve a mixture program which i'll explain later but this is an assignment problem we will start assigning items into bin types generally and free regions so because we don't have free regions i mean that emanate from previously Pack beans already, right? So because for now we don't have anything, we just start with a true bean types. And if we solve an assignment problem with a mixture programming, we may get this solution. So what it will tell us? It will tell us that, well, for given items, and look, we don't consider really two dimensions now. We only consider the area or the cost, right? Uh, we only consider area and we try to reserve space so that allocated beans, their space is enough to cover the space of unpacked items, right? So we don't really consider geometric, uh, geometry of uh, bean packing problem in this case. We have this dimensionless items, we convert their dimensions into areas and we deal with areas. So that's why if we solve this mixture program, uh, it will tell us, okay, use six copies of type T2 and two copies of type T1 because this space should be enough to cover the space of, um, of our items. So what we do now, we select the best or the most, uh, the, the best packing well, according to some fitness function, which we'll discuss later. So where we'll place, for example, element 40. So we will not be um, introducing all the beans immediately into partial solution. We only reserve this space. We will only take one copy of the bean, and in this case, it will be T1, and we will place element 40 there. And we will have tentative assignment for all other unpacked items. So for example, element one will be tentatively assigned or planned for uh, type two B, okay? So, and if we will calculate, so this, so we have six copies of T2 and we have two copies of T1. So that's why generally we have six times 100 and we have two times 
28, we will get this estimated cost 656, which is less than 700. So this solution is still potentially feasible, right? So if we will make a cut, we'll decide on the cut. So this would become our free space. And this will become unused region where we may potentially pack some other items from the set of unpacked items. So that's why from iteration zero, we come to iteration one. And now we still consider new, potentially new beans. And we consider R1, which is the outcome of cutting one of the beans in our previous iteration. So what we can do, we can solve this mixture program again, a new assignment. And now we can place element 13 into this region and element one will go to this beam. So we recalculate the estimated cost, which is still less than 700, uh, all good. Now we take one copy of this uh, T true beam and you see that all other items, they still are covered by, uh, by the space, right? Allocated by uh, new bits. So this solution, this partial solution is still uh, potentially feasible. And then we just uh, do another glitting cut. So, and we come to iteration two. Now R1 is uh, the product of cutting T2 and we still solve the same problem. So a new solution may place element 10 and element three. So again, we recalculate the estimated cost. So we had 128 as the previous cost here. So uh, the current cost of this assignment is five times 100 plus two times 28. So which is 556 and plus 128 of already the cost of the partial solution. So we get estimated cost, which is less than 700. So, and well, we keep working with this. The only thing is that sometimes we may get regions which are small enough and we can pack there anything. We can, well, exclude them immediately. So some regions are still useful and we may keep going. So sometimes we will come to the situation where we may cut our um, our regions or our beans in different way. So uh, we may call this as pattern alpha and this as pattern beta. So we will need to make a decision, but actually the mixture program will make this decision because now we have mutually exclusive subset. We either can cut this R1 in the way that we pro produce a strip on the top of element 12, or we uh, make in the way that we produce this strip at the right of element 12. But we have two possible regions from uh, pattern alpha, and we have two possible regions from uh, pattern beta. And we will introduce both opportunities, both options into our mixture program in the next iteration. And we will ask it to select the best uh, combination to pack the remaining items. So the same happens when we consider, for example, cutting of element true from T true type of beam. So again, we are getting mutually exclusive subsets. Okay, so if we will come to iteration four, here where we have those subsets, and if we do packing, then, well, this one is not used as well as this subset is not used because element 15 went to R1, uh, of the first subset and element 11 went to our second subset into R6. So now what we do, we keep cutting, keep making new regions, introducing new beans. Well, where we stop actually? Well, we stop if we can pack them all eventually and we don't exceed the given upper bound. Right. So, but it's very possible, right? And that's the idea of using dual feasible function as a, a feasibility constraint so that we will stop earlier, right? So that's why we need those feasibility constraints because we can prove in feasibility earlier. So in this case, for example, we see that we already have accumulated the cost of 528 and now we can 
well, place element six into your T, well, T true being, right? But we will need two copies of it, which will cost us 200. So 200 plus 528, it will become value which exceeds the given upper bound. So we can terminate this immediately. So you see that we can prove the search earlier, but just based on the space or on the areas, it will be an application of continuous lower bound or continuous measure, which is still weak. So we will we'll go too far before we can conclude that this search is fertile and uh, there is nothing we can do. So that's why, well, lifting the areas and applying the new lower bounds based on uh, those lifted areas, right? Modified areas of the items, uh, we can strengthen and we can conclude that the remaining space is not enough. So we can allocate space, so well, subject to the given upper bound so that we can pack all the items. And with little physical functions, we can do it earlier. So uh, if we will consider mixed group program, so what we have, we have our, uh, I will go quickly through this model. We have uh, XIK, which is assignment variable, which assigns item I to be K. We have YIK, which is just a date of assignment, like we had here, right? This one, just a date of assignment. So it means that we don't, put this item immediately into this region and cut it away, but we will uh, reserve space in the future iterations, right, for these items. So it's still part of our solution process. And then we have EI, this is a penalty for unassigned items. So we use this as part of our approach. Then uh, we have ZT, which determines the number of new bins, so how many copies we need. And we have this variable GI, which tells us which pattern we should apply alpha pattern. So make the first cut horizontal or make the first cut vertical. So, well, just about constraints of our mixture program. So we have uh, this constraint that limits the number of assigned items. So it means that we cannot generally uh, uh, assign more than one item in a region. So, but at the same time, we can plan an item to be packed there in this region in the future iteration. So that's why we have this reserving space constraint, which is part of look ahead. So we say that item is either packed immediately or is planned to be packed in this space, in this region, in the future iteration, right? Or it will be already unpacked, which means that we get a feasible solution immediately. So then we can apply just normal continuous bounds uh, because this is an area of an item. And we say that, um, well, the total area of items packed into a single region must not exceed the area of that region. So the same we do by reserving the space uh, that we get from uh, new bins. So ZT is related to the number of copies of a bin type T. Uh, we just calculate the total area and we uh, say that it should be large enough to cover all assigned uh, items. So and this one is just limiting uh, the total cost of new beans. So we stop earlier if we already can provide solution better than the existing uh, primal bound. So now what we do, so it works very similar to what we do with uh, Areas, now we apply dual physical functions. So this lambda IK is a modified size or modified area in our case of uh, item I. And you see that we apply the same way as we do with areas. The only thing is now that our right hand side is one because we normalize everything to one. So one is uh, the full capacity of that region. Right, and this lambda i case they are scaled to the modified size or modified area uh, area of the target region k. So, and we do the same uh, for bin types. Uh, the only thing is now that z t can be greater than one. Right, so how many copies? It depends on the solution of the mixture program, and we have constraints that will 
make this uh, disjunction uh, between two pairs of uh, regions. Either we make the first card horizontal or we make our first card vertical. So we select either alpha pattern or the beta pattern. So this is all together wrapped into one model. And now we only have different uh, object definitions. So we generally have three models out of this. So the first model, it just maximizes utilization of, uh, the, the, of the free space. So this is classical uh, backing coefficient. This is the size of assigned uh, or the total area of assigned items bar divided by the area of area of, of the region K. Right? So we try to make as dense as possible our packing. Okay? So this model works very well, it's very fast, but in some cases it's greedy because it may pack very, very, very densely some regions, but they may appear later infeasible because it just makes so tight packing, right? It may use the full capacity, but later on, when we will see some gaps also from cutting, glitting cutting, and generally uh, underestimation of the space, we may easily come up to the situation that these decisions uh, led us to infeasible solutions. But the good thing that um, they can be calculated just in milliseconds, those means. So our second model is, that's why an alternative to our first model, because the idea is to use um, our factors, so filling factors. So what is generally the filling factor packing coefficient for this region, right? So for example, uh, assigning these items to this region will use 0.8 as a fraction of that region. So another would give us 0.7. And this model, it minimizes this C, where C is the fraction of the, uh, of the use space. So we try using this mean sum model to pack them evenly, right? So packing evenly might be not best approach in terms of utilization of the space, but when it's constrained by a uh, primal bound that already exists, right? So um, the incumbent solution, it actually works well because we solve this MIP and we reserve space, enough space, so that we can make a mistake in our later iterations. So we have enough gap so that in later iterations, some um, items may fill that gap. So we underestimate the space, but later on, we get rid of, well, this impact because we reserve enough. So that's why this model tries to, uh, um, well, distribute items so that they take capacity evenly. Okay, so it takes more time to solve, but still uh, roughly milliseconds, right? And uh, we have our uh, min max uh, model, which uh, has this worst case assignment. So it considers generally uh, the worst case, the smallest in the smallest item that we can pack into a region, and then it considers its packing or utilization coefficient, and it tries to uh, generally. Uh, minimize this coefficient. So that's why this is reversed. So now we divide the area of the target region by uh, the area of the item. So we try to um, pack in a way that the worst case, so the smallest item to the largest area would be uh, eliminated, right, from the solution. Well, this model is really uh, good when we try to find some hidden solutions. We try to escape from a local optima, which is produced by model one and two during the search. So, uh, well, it's not that much to discuss here, but we have macro level and micro level. So this is just the framework that we use. And this framework can be applied for also other bin packing problems. So what we do, we have initialization we'll call search. What we do, we consider well, our search will apply mixed view programs and do the search for us. So it will take an instance of our problem and try to find a solution. So if solution is better than the existing bound, then we will update the incumbent solution. And um, well, if runtime is not exceeded yet, then we will try to run 
uh, our diversification mechanism. So this is our upper layer, right? So what we have as our lower level or micro level, we have this search procedure, which is sitting during here. What it does, it will, first of all, initialize the environment and call pack, right? In a way that this pack will solve those MIPS, like I showed this in using our Uric example, it will be packing them iteratively. So it will try to pack using MIP the given items. So now the question is if this um, call is successful. So if not, what we will do, we will try to increase the counter of unsuccessful solutions. So if it's, it is successful, then we will um, we'll update our incoming solution. And we will try to continue with the same, let's say, search space, right? We will also update the, this set B, which is the set of best packed beans. We will consider it later. And then we will call this diversification uh, mechanism, which will update the items to the cost. So, well, whatever happens here, we uh, then consider if the number of iteration exceeds. So we have this new. So if yes, then we try to select the dense beans and try to apply specification mechanisms. If no, so it means that we failed with, uh, for example, our MIP approach, what we do, we try now to change the MIP model objective from model one to model two. And when model two will fail for many times, we will start applying model three, its objective function, because we'll try to uh, search using approach that potentially can find some hidden solutions. So we change the uh, MIP model in this case. And we keep going with this. So as you can see here, what we optimize is the assignment cost. So we deal with the pseudo costs. So uh, multiply by this packing coefficient or this packing ratio. So we try to diversify the search. So we try to uh, uh, modify this coefficients and we apply a procedure which is, which is called sequential value correction. And this is quite classical for bin packing problem. But uh, well, it tags a pseudo cost or pseudo price to each item and it searches for a packing that maximizes the sum of pseudo costs. Right. So, and then, well, we change this, right? We propagate. So the idea that, well, the idea is that we change this in a way that propagates the success of previous assignments to uh, future iterations. Then we try to facilitate packing of larger beans first and um, generally, well, get different orders of packing in some sense, right? Okay. So, and this is also used to avoid, uh, in some sense, uh, this symmetric nature of bin packing problems. So we use this formula. So, and it has two terms, the first term and the second term. So the first term is that we take the previous value with a coefficient beta or delta, delta i. And this delta i depends on success or well, what is historical average packing ratio where of the bean where this item has participated in the past. So, so this is how delta i is defined. But with this fraction, we take the portion of the previous uh, value of the pseudo cost. Well, the second part of this term actually facilitates packing of most complicated items. Complicated items means that they were packed with the sum beans, but according to other items, they were not that successful. So where they were packed, those beans appeared fully packed, right? So it means that their packing coefficient was small. So, uh, well, it can be seen because this is a packing coefficient and this is area divided of the item divided by the area of the bean type. So generally, um, this value increases as this packing coefficient decreases when solutions become, well, solution, uh, well, assignment to this bean becomes, and generally this bean becomes not that efficient when we deal with this item. Okay, so, and we have just an original value. So when we would like to reset, we uh, 
and when once we can pack some items, for example, we set this uh, coefficient to the maximum value, and uh, we use larger power here. Okay. So, and then we also use intensification mechanism. So if we will have a look at our previous solution, then the idea is very simple. Look, uh, for example, these items, they are nicely packed together, right? And they form so-called dense packing. Uh, so the question is why we should reconsider this during the search. So that's why what we do, we collect those items, we generally uh, have caching, right? But generally, what we do, we select this bin, even if the previous solution is infeasible, like in our case, we preserve this bin as it is because it's like 100% packing coefficient, and we only deal with the, the rest of, um, of the problem. So we have partial solution, and we now apply the search just for unpacked items. Okay, so because the main battle is around areas that are very hard to pack, right? So, and in this case, we can mitigate the size of the problem. So because we use MIPS, we also can reduce uh, the runtime because we get, we're getting less assignments and less items to consider. So this helps with the runtime and also helps to achieve uh, good solutions very, very quickly. So, well, experimental setup. So we use, um, classical examples from the literature. So we have 10 classes, we have 20, 40, 60, 80, and 100 items in uh, one instance. So we have five types of bins, um, 10 instances per problem, and we are calculating this uh, with a one and 10 minutes time limit. And we will compare this results to only existing results in the literature, so results of uh, home control. Uh, they applied simulated and leading uh, heuristic, um, and I think packing was done by using dynamic programming, so shelf algorithm. Okay, so let's have a look at the results. So they, there are good things and bad things. So good things is that for some classes, we can dramatically improve well, assuming that previous results, they were really good already, um, we can dramatically improve the, the results. So for example, class one, class three, class five, seven, eight, and so on. So generally we get good results. So we can match 160 instances, right? And improve 294 best known, uh, so new, new results, best known results for, the, for those 294 instances out of 500. So as you see classes two, four, and six, we don't perform that well as for example, table search, but it's very important uh, in the scope of those all visible functions. So these classes have very large items to bin ratio. So it means that generally we have not that many bins, maybe one or two, but we have many items. So it may be a situation where all 100 items will go to one or two bins only. So we have very dense packing in this case in terms of the number of items in one bin. So, and these instances, they are complicated because, and they're challenging because if you have a wrong guess with the original bin and estimation of the volume or of the area in this case, then you may select the wrong bin type and then you will not get um, packing, which will tightly use the free space, right? So it's really challenging. And it's interesting in terms of this experiment because we see that dual physical functions, they don't help us here. So the real thing behind dual physical functions is that, um, so I think, uh, one hour now. Okay, so I'm finishing. So it's really important that um, um, they are scaled to the bin size. So uh, if we have small items and large bin, so all according to uh, the scheme, according to dual feasible functions, all those items will be just uh, ignored. So they, well, this is where they don't work. 
Okay, so I will skip these results, but we also get some improvement uh, for classical single size beans. And so, um, well, I will not conclude with uh, all the things that I have already showed, but this approach is generic, so we try the same approach for a uh, two-dimensional um, packing problem where we don't have guillotine costs, but we have due dates for items and it worked also very well. So some things that I would like to highlight here are some further thoughts is about dual feasible uh, function kind of approach. So some further improvements and improvements can be done in the area of different branching because normally branching and decisions are done based on assignment. So we may have different assignment rules or maybe branching based on cards and also about hard and easy instances. So the topic that was raised many times uh, by Professor uh, uh, Smith Miles. So uh, we always consider on some features that can this well dual visible functions can be one of feature to define if instances are hard or easy to solve, like we have for class two, four, and six. So we have we may use them as another uh, criterion to decide about uh, how to generate hard instances. Okay, so thank you. Sorry for exceeding the time limit. So I, I don't know, Frank, if anyone has a question.